Hey guys, and welcome to week seven or data screening part two. So we're going to work with the same information we worked with last week and now finish out our data screening to include assumptions. So the next steps are following what we finished last week. So remember that we checked for accuracy by looking at categorical and continuous values, things in and outside the um, min and maximum values that you could have, as well as, you know, thinking about what were probable values. Okay. We looked at missing data and how one might impute missing data and the types of things that you can and can't impute. And then we thought about outliers, like what are outliers and how do we find and eliminate them if necessary? What else could we now consider? So most of those first three steps are really about clean data. And I call this whole thing data cleaning, but it's really our data screening. But that first half is really data cleaning. So thinking about um, having the best presented data, so to speak, that you know is accurate to the best of your knowledge and is um, excluding people who maybe are outside the range of what you're interested in. However, there are certain things for each statistical test that then we would need to check. So assumptions are things that we assume are accurate or true for the statistical test to provide a accurate response, so to speak. So if these um, precursors hold, then the statistical answer that you get is appropriate. It may not be the answer you want if you're wanting to reject the null, but at least I know that that T value is based on normality and linearity. So these are things that should be, not true, should be checked to assume that they're at least held, holding up. And so for parametric stats, now this parametric stats, this means things that are based on the normal distribution. So ANOVAs, t-tests, um, regression, correlation. Non-parametric stats include things like chi-square, log regression, and there's a whole bunch more, the Mann-Whitney test. And so we just, for most of our semester, we're going to do parametric statistics. So these are the things we wanna check. Okay, the first one is independence, and we're gonna work through each one of these one at a time additivity, then we'll take a break, then we'll finish with linearity, normality, homogeneity, and homoscedasticity. Okay, and those are together for a reason. So let's start with independence and work our way down. So in this procedure, what we'll do to check for literal, like mathematically check for some of these, is we'll use a fake regression. Okay, now this regression is fake because it allows us to view the numbers that we're interested in. And it's fake in the sense that it's not a real statistical test. So we don't look at the output from the regression itself and you know, use it to answer any questions. We're just using that mathematically to get us to um, the numbers we need to check for these assumptions. Okay. So it's no, not a real analysis, just a way to get the numbers we're interested in. This procedure is into the Bachnik and Fidel uh, monster multivariate book that you could use as a doorstop. It is so large. <laughs> so I'll give you the short and sweet version here. And when we run regression as a real statistical analysis where it's part of the hypothesis test we're interested in, we can use this same procedure and with some alterations that we'll describe when we get to that chapter. So the first one here is independence. Now there are ways to check for independence. <laughs> However, it's really just something you have to know based on the research design of your study. Oh, excuse me. It's that like weird time of the year where the weather is like 50 one day and 20 the next. Okay, so assumptions here. Um, for independence, the definition is that the errors in the model are unrelated. Okay, sometimes you'll hear this described as uh, identically and independently distributed, or I ID. Yeah, I think I got the eyes right. Either way, it's this idea that my error is unrelated to your error. And the best way I've ever heard this described where it's not <laughs> is, let's say that you are 
um, running a test where you first weigh your participants. So maybe you're doing a weight loss study, whatever, you weigh them. But it's been pouring outside. And so everyone's shoes are really muddy. And so when the first participant steps on the scale, they leave some mud behind. And that affects the weight of the next participant. So now their, their scores are no longer independent because that first person went first. The other way you can think about this is like cheating on an exam. Your score is related to someone else's. It's not your own. Okay. Um, when error terms are correlated, sometimes it's called autocorrelation. It does happen, but generally you just want to know that each person's scores are independent. Now, in some studies, repeated measures, we allow scores to be related. So we take multiple scores from the same person and there are statistical ways to deal with that. So you don't violate the assumption of independence as long as you use the right statistical test. And so mostly this is just a, a check, a reminder to think about making sure that you run your your study properly, you don't allow people's scores to be correlated. Um, and generally, if they are, they have to do a special type of test. So if you don't have independence, your numbers don't mean a whole lot because the error terms are, it's impossible to know whose error term is whose, which makes confidence intervals very tricky because they're based on standard error. And a significance test is error, we uh, variance on the top that we understand divided by variance on the bottom we don't understand or error. So they both tests, both things become problematic to understand. And that's often really just a matter of our research design. So a well-designed study does not have this problem. Now, the second assumption we're gonna cover here is additivity. And for all of our assumptions, we're gonna call it the good thing. So independence is a good thing. Additivity is the good thing. The bad thing is sometimes called multicollinearity or singularity. And this is when we have several variables that we're adding to our, to our model. So we have more than one independent variable. We have multiple independent variables. And additivity is when each variable adds something to the model. Okay? And if variables are not additive, it, it implies that they're too related. So this mostly happens in regression style analyses where you have two independent variables that are very highly correlated. And at that point, why are you using both of them? If they're highly correlated, they tell you the exact same thing. So why use both? When really you should just use one or average them or some other solution because you're losing power. So each variable we add takes away from our degrees of freedom, which reduces power. And if they're not adding something, why do it? Okay. So this is sort of like a conversation. The more voices we have, the more difficult it is to, uh, to hear a single person. So if each voice isn't adding something to the equation, then we should take it out. I don't know if my microphone is catching the cat down the hall screaming at a sock, but I hope it is. So please enjoy. <laughs> so each voice in this conversation, they're not adding something, we should eliminate them. Back to additivity. So why use the same variable twice? And just a reminder that the violation of this assumption is called multicollinearity. Singularity is when they're so correlated, it's almost perfect. So we're in like correlation equals 0.9 to almost one. Okay. And then, oh, I have it as multicollinearity is 0.9 and singularity is 0.95. Now, when I run regression, I will get into an area that some people, times people call suppression, where variables start to kind of essentially scream over each other. And that starts at about 0.7. And we'll, we'll look at that more when we get to regression. And the additivity is only required when you have multiple continuous variables that are in the same analysis. If you only have one dependent variable, or one um, independent variable in regression, you don't need this. So sometimes you'll see that this won't be part of our consideration when we talk about each test separately. And that's simply just because there's only one. You literally can't check if things are too correlated if there's only one. Now, the best way to check for this is to um, check for the correlation between variables. 
And if those correlations are too high, you combine the problematic ones or pick one. Or uh, in regression, there are specific ways to handle this um, exact problem. And notice that we're starting with the same analysis as the last lecture, and I mostly hid it from you, except for the fact that mice pretty much prints out no matter what you try to tell it not to do. So this is the mice section from before, but here's our structure of our no out data set we were working with. This is our last step with no outliers. And we can see that we've got pretty much the same data we had before. And so to check for this, I'm gonna run a correlation on my no out data set. And I'm gonna run this on items one and four, or, or on all items but one and four. Okay, and why, why did I exclude those? Well, that's because that's our categorical variable and it won't run on categorical variables. You'll get the error message that X must be numeric. And then what we do is we look through this giant table and make sure that nothing is above 0.9. Or we could make this a little more visual, which is always a good thing. And we'll use the core plot library. Now the core plot library takes a correlation matrix like we just looked at and translates it into a pretty picture. And so what you do is you run core plot on the correlation table Okay, it's my same one, so I uh, left out one um, sex and socioeconomic status. And what we see here, these dark blue dots are the variable correlated with itself. That's okay. That should always be one, or math has not, has not held for that day. <laughs> like the apocalypse is coming, the math, is, the math has lost its mind, okay. So age here correlated with itself at a one. And you'll see that down the diagonal, okay? That's part of what's called the identity matrix, right? The ones down the middle. So those are expected. So don't say we have problems because age is correlated with itself. What we wanna do is look at the off diagonal here. Either way, the bottom half and the top half are the same. And you wanna look for things that are, are very dark red, like my maroon shirt here, or very dark blue. And what we see is in this resiliency area, they are very correlated. It also gets bigger in size. Because these scales, these items are all on the same scale. However, none of them are this exact big blue circle. So they're probably okay. And so what I do when I have this sort of bigger table here is I just do a quick glance and I go, you know, I might wanna check what RS10 and RS2 are, because that's kind of dark. And let's make sure that isn't problematically dark. Okay, so two and 10, let's back up. Okay, so we've got RS2, let's come down here to 10. And that particular color of blue dot represents 0.6. So most of these are probably fine because that's the sort of biggest bluest dot that we have. Now on a scale, we do expect items to be highly correlated because that's how these scales should work. Um, but we wouldn't want them to be perfectly correlated. All right, the second assumption we're gonna test here is linearity. And linearity is the assumption that the relationship between your variables is linear and not curvilinear. There are curvilinear relationships between many different things or any kind of uh, something with a bend in it. But for the parametric statistics that we're going to learn, we want everything to be linear. So ANOVA regression, these are all forms of what's called least squares math, which is, you know, linear. It's called a general linear model for a reason. And so linearity, bleh, linearity involves both at the univariate level, meaning each variable paired against every other variable, and at the multivariate level, meaning the linear combinations of the variables together. So the easiest thing to do is to check the multivariate level. And when that does, if that goes wrong or looks bad, back up and start doing the pairs one at a time. Because with 14 items alone, that makes for a lot of pairs, one to two, one to three, one to four, you know, one to 14, two to three, two to four, 
and on. That's a lot of pairwise combinations. And so if our overall multivariate test looks okay, then I can probably ignore most of the pairwise combinations. If the overall test looks bad, then that's when I'd start going through pairs at a time. And don't forget, in one of our previous videos, we looked at how to make one of these cool um, G-Galley plots <laughs> that, or G-G-Alley, either way, <laughs> um, that would actually plot all those bivariate scatter plots at once. So there are ways to kind of make that a little bit faster. Okay. All right. So I think this just sums up what I said. So if the assumption doesn't look like it's met, back up to that graphs chapter, look for the code for um, GG. G, I don't know if it's GG Alley or G Galley. Hmm. Hmm. I think it's aggregate. So it's A G G R and then the name of the data set. So to do that though, we have to now build this fake regression that we started talking about at the beginning of the lecture. Okay. So let's create this fake regression and use it. Okay. So for many of the statistical tests we're going to use, there are diagnostic plots built into the function, but not all functions are created equal. And so what we're doing here is giving you the toolkit to analyze any of our parametric statistics with or without the diagnostic plots that are available in those packages. So if we kind of assume that there are no other extra helping hands in the um, easy library, for example, that we'll use for Nova, then we can you know, create a workflow that works no matter what we're doing. Okay. And so that's one reason why I really like this kind of procedure is that it works for almost everything I can do. Okay. There are a couple of things like, um, uh, mixed linear models where I have really complicated research design that I have to do this procedure slightly differently, but that's only because I have to control for independence. Okay. So this guide allows me to do pretty much 95% of parametric statistics, and that's learning one set of rules instead of a whole bunch. Okay. That being said, there are specific things that will tweak a little bit here and there for each analysis. So when we get to regression, we'll talk more about outliers. That'll be slightly different. When we get to NOVA, we'll talk about Levine's test. So each one has just a small tweak because of the specific kind of customary procedures for that particular analysis. So first we're gonna create our fake regression. And as a reminder, this has been a little bit, but we've talked about chi-square as our cutoff score. So when we did Mahalanobis distance in our outliers section, we talked about distance is a score that is never negative, right? And most distances are close to zero. And then only a few of them are very far away. So what we do in Mahalanobis distance is we use a chi-square distribution to represent that pattern because it best mimics that. And we only eliminate participants whose scores are way out there. They're way past the finish line. <laughs> they are on Mars, the rest of us are here. In a similar fashion, we will use the chi-square distribution here as part of our fake regression because that means that the error terms are chi-square distributed. Okay? A lot of small errors and only a few bigger errors. Okay? If we pretend error is all positive, because sometimes you get people's scores right positive-wise and sometimes you get them wrong negative-wise, but that being said, um, the error terms, if we make them all positive, are chi-squared distributed, okay? A lot of things close to zero, very few things far away. However, once we standardize these to make our lives easier for interpretation purposes, uh, the standardization procedure converts that to a normal distribution. Okay. And so we're gonna use chi-square to help us kind of create this fake regression because we know that a lot of this kind of these distributions of error should be chi-square distributed, again, if they're only positive. But then we're gonna z-score or standardize most of this output just because it makes the whole thing easier to interpret. <laughs> and once you z-score it, it now follows this kind of normal procedure rules, which we'll get into in just a minute. So let's look at the actual code here. It's pretty simple. 
So I'm going to create a random variable using the r chi square function. So r chi square creates a random variable based on the chi square distribution. Q chi square helped us find our cutoff before. So make sure this is r chi square. I want to get as many of them as I have participants and base this on a distribution with seven degrees of freedom. Why? Seems to work. Meh. <laughs> Any number bigger than two tends to give you enough variability to make this um, procedure worthwhile. Okay. So you can use any number here, but I recommend just pretty much anything bigger than two. Two is kind of too flat. Okay. Now I'm going to take my random variable that I just made and use it in a fake regression. So LM here stands for linear model. This is our regression analysis. Okay. And the way you read this line here is you say y is predicted by, so that little tilde, little squiggle here, means is predicted by or is estimated from. Then I put a dot here, I'm saying all the variables in the data set. So predict my random variable from every data data point, data, you know, every variable I have. Okay, so think about that for a second. I am predicting a random variable from a bunch of organized data. So what should I get back? And what I should get back is that Sometimes I can predict good, sometimes I can predict bad, all by chance. So my prediction here should also be somewhat random because my, um, because I, I, I don't, I'm not predicting with any, like I'm using real data to predict a noise variable. And so the prediction should be random, so the errors should be random. Okay. And when I say errors, what I mean is I am estimating this score. So. Let's predict participant four's random variable from participant four's data. You know, and it's just a guess, really, <laughs> right? And so the error term is how close our guess was. And the guesses should sometimes be really far and sometimes be really close, but mostly really close because it's just a random guess. Okay. But either way, it should, the random, the error term should be random because we're predicting a random variable. Now the error terms should also be random in a real analysis because of independence, right? So they shouldn't all be um, uh, related to each other because then that would be bad on our data set here. The next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna z-score all this stuff. So we're gonna standardize the, um, get the standardized residuals. And so the, that's our error term. So these are actually considered the studentized residuals, but that's okay. It's basically creating them into a z-score function. So these are our error terms. And then our fitted values, which was our predicted score. So we're gonna scale. That's remember the z-score function, our fitted values. So fake dollar sign fitted. And that's okay if you don't, if you're like kind of like, okay, I don't know if I totally get this. We're going to do this a couple times. But the basic idea here is that we're setting up a prediction that should show us that the variables are somewhat random, like the prediction here is somewhat random. If the prediction isn't random, that implies there's something wrong in the background. Okay. So let's see what happens. Now, with that set up, there are a couple of different ways we can get our linearity plot. And remember that linearity is the assumption that the variables are linearly related. Okay, so we don't want curves. And there's actually a ton of ways to check for this analysis. I just happen to like QQ plots. Sometimes these are called PP plots. So two lines of code here, QQ norm on our standardized residuals. And then I drew on a line here, AB line zero one just draws this nice line here, just for visualization purposes. So what should I see? Well, check it out down here on the bottom. That's the normal distribution. Okay, it runs from, it, well, sometimes you'll see it past negative two, but in our case here, two to two. And then it says, here's the sample quantiles. Okay. So it's looking at where our residuals are lying and then comparing them to the theoretical place that they should lie. And we should have a lot of them that are very close to zero and only a few that are farther away from zero. 
And so essentially what this does is it plots um, kind of where they should be falling in a normal distribution against a theoretical normal distribution. So some people use this plot to check for normality as well. But what we're gonna use it for is we just want these to line up on the line. Okay. Because if they're falling within their quantiles, right? Uh, that implies that there is some linear relationship between the variables because otherwise they would bend. Okay. So as these plots bend, this particular plot, what we're seeing is that they're not falling in quite the right place because instead of being straight, they're curved. Okay. And sometimes you'll see them look very, um, I've seen S-shaped curved ones. That implies that there's a, a, a cubic relationship, just kind of a U-shape is not good. That implies that there's a squared relationship okay. with a caveat. Generally, I only look between two and two. Okay, so we've talked a lot about how for z-scores, if they're past two on the standardized scale, that is, okay, one point, I think, point one, no, one percent. <laughs> so uh, uh, total, so 0.5% on each side, okay. So, once we get past two standard deviations, we're talking about a very small proportion of the population and they're very hard to predict out past those points. Okay, so right, our normal bell curve distribution, most of the data's in the middle. It's hard to deal with the data's on the end. Okay. And for many of our cases, outliers can be problematic. You'll see them on these plots if you don't, especially if you don't remove them. And um, what we see is like if the data bends past two and two, it's probably okay. okay. If the data is very curved within two to two, it's probably not okay. okay. So generally the rule here is gonna be look between negative two and two and just make sure that the dots are fairly close to the line. Okay. So I would tell you that you need to have like sort of this like be nice to the plots. And generally only if I, if I, if it pops up and I'm like, oh, is when I think they're bad. Okay, so this plot is fine. And the first couple of times you look at them, you're too, you're too mean to them, right? So you're like, oh no, it's bad because these are dots aren't on the line. Like, that's fine. They just need to be close. Okay. I promise when you see one, you'll see one. Okay. Now, the other way to get this exact graph actually is to use the plot function that's built into the linear model. So you put in the name of our saved fake analysis and you tell it plot, give me plot number two. Okay. And it'll give me the exact same plot. Okay. Um, and then it just happens to label who these two people are. Okay. Now we've already looked for outliers. And so I don't tend to use this one, um, even though it tells me who these plots are because I've already checked to make sure they weren't outliers. Okay. But either way is the way you can get this linearity plot. All right, now the dots on these plots, just to kind of like sum all of that like conceptual idea up at once, is a representation of model fit, right? So regression is a model we've discussed. So each outcome, each Y dependent variable, which in our case is a random variable, is predicted by each independent variable X here plus some form of error. And we're predicting a random variable. So the errors here should be randomly distributed. Lots of small numbers that are centered around zero. And we standardize them just to help us interpret what's going on because then the scale for all of the assumptions, linearity, normality, homogeneity, and homoscedasticity, all of them involve looking between two and two. And so each dot represents that person's standard residual plotted against the theoretical residual for that area of the distribution. Okay. So what should I look for? Okay. This is just later when you're looking at the slides, like what was that thing that she said? Here it's written down. Okay. So most of the data in a normal distribution is between a negative two, a negative two on a z-score and a two. And that's 98% of the data. This time I can math, 1% on each side. So we want those dots to line up between two and two. If it curves away past two and two, it's probably fine. Okay. So we want to check those, but we're less concerned if they curve away from the line.
click, click, click. And so then I've printed the plot again, although I don't remember why. Oh, I think I was supposed to like go talk about it and then show you the slide and then come back. So how would I judge to this slide? I would say it's okay. okay. These two dots out here, these couple dots out here, no big deal. Okay. So we're gonna pause here to keep these videos from not being too long. And then in the next video, um, we're gonna talk, uh, finish out these sets of slides. So normality, homogeneity, and homoscedasticity using this same fake regression. So don't forget too much between now and the next one.